All right, guys, welcome along to episode number two of the Notcast. Hope everybody is well and ready for another packed episode of discussion with not only myself, but as always, the fabulous Deathwish808. How are you doing, buddy? Doing fantastic. Thanks for having me again, and hope you're doing well. Well, you are one half of the show, so the show wouldn't be the same without you, for sure. Well, I, I, I guess so. I mean, <laughs> te- technically speaking, uh, seeing as how if you did it by yourself, it would still be a podcast, but... Yeah, but then I would be the insane rambling man just rambling to myself. So, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't technically be the same and, and have the same purpose. Well, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I have the... Uh, I think I'm the king of rambling. So, going off on uh, tangents and such. So, yeah. Uh, how you been anyway, buddy? What you been up to? Here recently, mainly not sleeping. Nothing new there then. But yeah, nothing, nothing new. Uh, playing wordscapes, which I didn't get to play that much this weekend. But oh, the team will be disappointed. Deathwish, you let the team down, man. Uh, 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 yeah, it was the first time in a long time that I wasn't first. Uh, came in like number four on my team. Okay, but but we still won. Wow. So, yeah, team has gotten really, really good, and they they push harder than they ever have. Uh, I think I only got like four thousand something only. Uh, well, yeah. Well, last weekend I broke my uh, personal record, my PR, and I got fifty thousand and eleven. Okay. So, yeah, that, of course, uh, for people that don't know the tournament of uh, Wordscapes, uh, if you like word games, check it out. Uh, it's it's a fun game. Uh, but yeah, the, the tournament starts at 6 p.m. Eastern time uh, on Friday and ends at 11 p.m. on Sunday. So it's basically... Two and a half days, kind of, but yeah. I I played a little bit Friday, and then Saturday I played very, very little. Maybe like 10 minutes. Then I didn't play again until I got back home on Sunday. Okay. At at about, uh, I think it was about 5, uh, 5 p.m.? Yeah. And... The, the amount of points I got Friday when I played was enough to carry me over to Sunday on the individual tournament. Okay. And then when I came back Sunday, I expected to be like, you know, eight, nine, tenth place. I don't know. I thought I would be blown out of the water, but I was still in second and behind by 600 points. So I started playing. And I'm like, not. Nah, I'm not. I haven't lost a singles tournament, and s- since I can remember, so I started playing, and I click in on my phone to watch. You know, with uh, with, if they're starting to play or not, if they're watching, yeah. So yeah, they were six hundred ahead of me, and I ended up. Uh, finishing about two thousand ahead of them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they 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 start to play. I'll say that like I I was probably like two hundred behind, and I noticed they went up by a hundred. And yep. But when I'm focused, I'm, I was playing tool, jamming it out, and just going at it. Yeah, they had they had no chance. <laughs> and right now, I uh, just moved up to number eight in the world for this month. Wow. Okay. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> it's more than pretty impressive. It's it's really impressive. Uh, yeah, I've been I've been hired. The funny thing is, though, uh, honestly, the 
and, and you know, I live in Virginia, and the number one in the world is almost always in Virginia for some reason. Okay. Yeah, I don't. You start going around uh, knocking on doors, kind of going to hunt them down. Take, yeah, take, I don't, take them out. I don't, in another I don't way. know why, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just like that for a while. Uh, I, I, well, a week ago, uh, the top three or four were from my state. Okay, but yeah, now it's like. Yeah, still top 10 is like there's at least three or four of us from from my state in the top 10 in the world and number one being from my state which is crazy you heard it here first guys um the most literate people in the world come from virginia state in america you heard it, you heard it here first guys <laughs> official it's a fact don't even question it there you go. Well, you can you can download the game and look it up right now. You heard it here first, guys. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, I said like you had. Um, no, I, I pretty much about the same weekend as me. Really, I didn't really do much this uh, this weekend. I haven't really been up to much. Um, wife was busy working, so I was just sort of hanging with the kids, playing some video games. Um, no, what, what games? Uh, I was just playing some Call of Duty Zombies actually with Evan, ah, and cool. then we was playing some Super Mario Odyssey with uh, Ariadna on the Switch. So, yeah, just okay, really, that's cool. Just hanging, just chilling out, not really up to much. So, it was nice. Well, I mean, that's good times. Uh, I'm, I'm sure kids enjoyed that. It's nice as well, just to have kind of like a lazy weekend where you haven't really got a lot to do and you can just. Take oh, back yeah. and uh, yeah, have a bit of fun. So, yeah, yeah it's, exactly. It's all, it's all good. Anyway, guys, um, so in this podcast, we're going to try something a little bit different. So, rather than doing it in one long take, this time around, we're going to, we're actually going to do it in separate chunks, which is going to allow us to record it over the period of time. So, we don't know how this is going to go. We're just trialing and still testing the water with the, the show. So, so as always, if you've got any comments or suggestions about how you feel this episode went, please do leave them in the comments below. Um, but without further ado, I think we'll jump into our first topic of conversation. That sounds like a plan. Okay, so I think I know you pretty well, Deathwish. Wouldn't you potentially agree that we know each other relatively well? Yeah, considering, you know, we've never actually hung out in person. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. one thing um, that I was kind of wondering, it'd be kind of interesting to have a deep dive into Death Wish and Knock here, but I wondered, do you have any fears? Uh, I think everybody does, you know, off the top of my head. Uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is something, it was a fear that I that I didn't used to have until, I mean, I was, when I was little, I didn't have it until it became a thing and that's claustrophobia. Okay. Uh, I, and I don't, I don't have claustrophobia in the sense like if I get in an elevator or I'm in a small closet, that doesn't bother me. But it is when we, when I was younger, me and my cousin were going through drain pipes and stuff. And then we got into, to where like you could walk through a lot of them. They were, they were quite big. Yep. Like storm drains and stuff. But then we had, there was one that was more like, that that would be under somebody's driveway. And we were like, basically small enough to fit in it. But it, it was quite long. I would say about 20 to 30 feet. And when I got, by the time I got to the middle, it got to where I couldn't move my arms either if they were forward, I couldn't move them backwards, or backwards, I couldn't move them forward. And that alone started uh, making the panic just come out like I've never felt before. Because yeah. I, I, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I couldn't get up. I couldn't. And I had to just squirm. And I had to keep myself calm to make it out. But, like, as soon as I can, as long as I can move my arms around. and But, yeah, like. 
anything like that. That's probably one of my biggest, really. Like, I'm not really afraid of heights. I'm not. Yeah. I don't, I, you know, I do. I just have nothing in particular other than that, really, that I can think of offhand. Stage, stage fright. Stage fright? Yeah. Like, like if if I if I'm not prepared, I, I, like I have no problem getting in front of people and doing speeches and stuff because I've I've done it. Yeah. But I'm also I'm also prepared. But if I get pulled up to like improv or something, and it's not something I'm at all prepared with, then yeah, I, I kind of just completely blank go blank and I'm done. And it's okay. like I can I can maybe once I get going. Squick it out, but yeah, that's kind of a no, no go for me. I just, like, I, I gotta be prepared. But yeah, it's it's interesting that you uh, mentioned that you're not sort of scared of heights because I would say heights is probably one of my biggest fears. But it's really weird. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm. Uh, how do I put this? Although I'm kind of scared of heights, I'm only scared of heights in certain occurrences and certain situations. So, for instance, if I'm on an aeroplane and I'm looking out the window, that doesn't bother me at all. What bothers me is if I am, like, really high somewhere and I'm, like, out in the open and I can feel, like, the air and the wind against me, that's when I start to kind of have, uh, like, a panic about um, heights and I, the, the fear starts creeping in for me. Weirdly enough, and I think thinking back, I'm pretty sure it was your channel on your old YouTube channel before it got um, whatever happened to it. Did you used to have a video of a guy changing a light bulb? Yeah. On yeah, I I remember like trawling through your videos once, and I <laughs> I sat here and I watched that video. No word of a lie, I was sat here, and even though I wasn't out and I couldn't feel the elements because. The guy in the video was out and exposed to the elements and on a ladder really high up in the air. I was literally sat here and my palms were literally dripping with sweat because <laughs> even though it wasn't me, the fear of somebody else being that high and exposed to the elements was kind of like really playing on me a lot. Yeah. It's it's really bizarre how like the mind works and, and plays tricks on you, but yeah, I did. You see the uh, film not so long ago about the um, two climbers as well. It was on Netflix, and they were like free climbers, and they they go out to the desert somewhere and they climb a real. I think it's called the Fall. And you're talking about the one where they climb this old tower. Yeah, that's like an old communication the, the, tower. The two girls. Right to the top. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, Again, so though, watching that exactly the same thing. Like they're they're getting high, and my wife's looking at me as I'm we're watching it, and she's like, "Are you all right?" I was like, "Yeah, me." The, the palms are getting a bit sweaty here. I'm, uh, I'm start, starting to panic a bit. So, yeah, I would say um, for me, definitely heights in certain situations is probably one of my biggest fears. But then I also have like some smaller, really weird fears as well. So I've got kind of like a fear of, I want to say it's like a fear like I, I can't look at them, but I've got a fear about knees or I'm, I'm really funny about knees. So... If like I, if anybody was to touch my knee, I don't know. I've just got this really weird fear, and I, I kind of like clam up, and I, it's like I don't, I don't know. I don't know what I think is going to happen. It's like there's just something about kneecaps, and like yeah. whether like whether it's like be something like that it somebody touched it and it's going to like move or it's something bad's going to happen. I don't know what it is, but geez, it absolutely freaks me out, and. My other really weird fear is, do you know the the best way I can describe them? They're like the 3D hologram kind of images. Right. And, you know, those sort of thing, the, the sort of things where if you turn them in in certain lights, they show a different picture. Yeah, yeah. If you was to get one of them and, like, scratch it, my God, I, I literally... Like a chalkboard? Went, no, no, it doesn't sound like a chalkboard. It's just like a real right. high pitch scratching noise, and oh, oh my god, it, it literally, I it petrifies me. I it brings me, it could bring me to tears. That's how bad it is for me. I really can't. I can't even right. stand. My my kids have got like some cups that have got the material on the side of it from McDonald's yeah. over the years. I can't even. I really struggle to pick them up and just to like wash them if they've used them. 
uh, in the sink yeah, because I've got one. Oh, geez, but yeah, we're quite interested to know like what your little if you've got any kind of like quirky fears or phobias. No, I, uh, going back to the height thing, uh, I don't, I'll kind of agree with you there. Like now, like sometimes I'll watch some videos and and because of the point of view camera, or they're just doing something completely like they're they're not like the the guy on the tower didn't bother me because no. like like as long as i know i'm secure then i'm fine with the height regardless yeah. like i've been up in hot air balloons i've done all kinds of stuff and no problem it's when i'm in like a situation to where i don't feel like i have control or i feel like i feel like it's a good possibility that i i could fall or i don't yeah. feel i don't feel stable but yeah, okay. other, otherwise, like if I, as long as I'm secure, you can hang me out over the edge of uh, one of the towers of Dubai, and, you know, <laughs> and I'd be fine as long as you know, weren't just like some of these idiots that are, they literally just hold on to somebody, and they're relying purely on each of their grips from from not falling, which I've seen plenty do, and it's like no, no, I'm. That right there, I gotta cut it off. But as far as weird ones, um anything. Got anything. Come on, surely you got something. I'm trying I'm trying to dig deep here. That's a tough one. I really don't nothing comes to mind. I mean, I have pet peeves, but that doesn't really count. Okay. So like things that you just that annoy you or just things that you can't stand in general? Yeah. I mean that like when if people are eating and they're smacking their lips, that that sends me from zero to ten real quick. Yeah, like I, I, I don't care. Here you are, whatever. I have to say, you know, like if you're chewing gum or or whatever it may be, I, you know, I will say something. Otherwise, I just I have to leave. It just it absolutely drives me up the wall. I can't yeah, stand it. I, I I can agree with that. I mean, my son is quite bad at that at the breakfast in the morning. I I he has like this thing where. I just genuinely don't think he knows how to breathe out of his nose. So as he's eating, he's like, and smacking his lips together as well. He's like breathing out and making these horrendous noises at the same oh, yeah. time. And it's just like, I literally, like, I just eat my breakfast as quickly as I can and just sort of get out of there because it, yeah, it's really one of those things, situations where I just cannot stand it for the life of me. If, that, if my kids did that, I'd make them eat outside. <laughs> Here's your trough. Now go and eat out there. Yeah, I don't care. If there's a foot of snow and it's negative twelve. Just <laughs> and if if you can't eat with that with your mouth shut, then that's where you are. Yeah. yeah now they learn real quick that you know not to 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 chew with their mouth shut. And I said it's not just for me. I mean, it is for me and my sanity because we lived together. You know, at the time and. I said, but it's also for the for your future self and other people, because a lot of people really don't like it. And yeah. it's annoying. And it's just it just yeah, and you don't want to be that person. No. You know. So just to, just for your own sake, don't do it. You know, don't no. get in the habit of it because it's a hard one to break because a lot of people don't realize they do it. Yeah, it's just something about when you're eating especially when you're out there's just certain etiquette and manners i mean i'm not completely prim and proper by any means but i do try to make sure i kind of have a certain etiquette because sitting at a meal table and having to watch somebody who is doesn't have any manners or have any etiquette is yeah it's it's not good it's not good at all <laughs> yeah i mean we were talking at least you know, when in my, my generation growing up, I mean, it, we didn't go, we weren't taught as far as like the, the high flute and rich, richy, rich people where they, they have three different forks for salad and main course and this and that, and then dessert and, and, and they got both sides all set up. Yeah. That's like a real formal kind of dinner, but yeah. we, we did have standards on no elbow, no elbows on the table. Uh, you know, sit up straight, you know, yeah. don't smack your, you know, just, just general stuff, Be, being courteous. You know, we were always taught to say, you know, please, thank you, sir, ma'am, you know, if if they were elders, 
Well, um, I mean, ma ma at the end of the day, man manners are free. So I'm, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm always polite. I've always tried and teach my kids to be polite. And yeah, I, I just, yeah, it doesn't take much, just a simple please or a simple thank you, especially when you're out in public and somebody's done something for you or, or even if your server's bringing you food, you know, just a, a nice thank you. I know it's the job, but, you know, why not be courteous towards them? Yeah, that brings up, I don't know how it is over there. Like when, say, for example, if, I, if I'm if i going into a store and, and there's somebody, you know, five steps behind me, I'll, I'll wait, hold the door for them. Yeah. Let them go, let them go through. And if, they, and if there's a few people, I'll wave them on in. And some people just walk on in like I'm their door man. Yeah. And, and don't even look or say a word. And it's like, yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome, you asshole. And, uh, and yeah, but, you know, I don't say anything. I just go on about my day. And, but then, you know, some people are like, oh, thank you very much. You know, uh, you know, no, no problem. I don't know if y'all are the same way or, well, if I ever walk through a door, I always look behind me and see if anyone is within the vicinity. And if there is somebody sort of following me or coming towards me, I will stand and hold the door open because, again, why not? It's just a bit of being polite again, isn't it? it yeah. It's similar sort of thing. Like, I, I don't know how it is over there, but when you're driving down a road and say there isn't enough room for two cars to pass at the same time and somebody has to pull over. It really annoys me when you're the person that's waiting for the other car and they just, same sort of thing as what you just said, they just drive straight past and they don't even put their hand up and acknowledge you the fact that, you know, you've pulled over for them. That's really frustrating. Yeah, yeah we can go on about drivers. Oh, man. Maybe that's a, <laughs> uh, maybe that's, maybe that's a topic for uh, uh, another discussion. Um, I think we've kind of, branched off the the fears and, and pet peeves uh, quite enough so maybe it's time to move on to something else okay so let's branch on to something else now i and we we touched on this briefly in the first podcast death wish and it's about like the differences between like nations and my nation your nation but let's take us both out of our comfort zone here and let's visit a nation where I don't think we've, well, I've certainly not been, and I doubt probably you've been. And I'm talking over in Asia, in the places of, say, uh, India and such. And what I kind of want to talk about is how crazy it is when you look at media of people driving and traversing the streets in countries like India, comparing it to how we drive and traverse our areas in the Western world. And I just kind of want to like say how crazy it is when you when you look at places like India, and you see the volume of people on the roads and using transport. How many accidents do you actually see? Don't you find it like bizarre that like there's all that hustle and bustle, yet there's no that you never ever see or never hear of from an outsider's point of view, of course, any like real bad disastrous collisions or accidents. Yeah, it, it kind of seems that way. I, I, like videos on YouTube and and what have you, at least for, that I've seen. Uh, you know, they'll usually sit there and shoot a, a you know a few minutes of an intersection, and it's just like a it's like you're just waiting for a big pile up, and everybody you know, especially with all the different kinds of mopeds and motorcycles and carts i mean you name it bicycles pedestrian pedestrians it's like how? yeah the, the, the farm around the corners walking his cattle across the road as well it's just like i don't, I don't want to seem like i'm being stereotypical here obviously this is just all sort of things you see in uh in media and stuff but what yeah. i kind of find interesting is and I just well i'll come back to that in a minute but i have kind of been in one of those situations when me and uh, Katie went to Morocco uh, about four years ago it was it wasn't on the scale that you see on those sort of Indian media but it was the same sort of thing we was like on the transfer bus going from the hotel back to the airport when we were leaving and there was just motorbikes like cutting in like here there and everywhere and it's I don't know they the the drivers don't seem phased by it at all they're just all zipping around and I just sort of thought to myself what would happen if you was a Westerner 
and you was put in that situation, like, are, are we too cautious as Western, as like Western world people? Do we have more stringent traffic laws and regulations to follow? I, I just don't know how yeah. we would like. How do you, how do you think we would cope if we went out to countries like that and we had to kind of drive in those sorts of countries? I think you, including myself. I'd say most people would absolutely be getting honked at because you hear it all the time over there anyway. <laughs> uh, so, so, so you're, you're going to expect that much of it. Yeah. And, and then, it, yeah, it's, it's because our, we don't have places like that, you know, where it's just a free for all. And, you know, and, and because there's a cop sitting right around the corner for us, we'll get a ticket. You know, because yeah. they, they just love. I mean, in the United States, they love giving out tickets. Yeah, and and they they have unofficial quotas, and the, and the more tickets they give out, the, the the more money they bring in for the tickets they write, it can kind of get them into a better squad car. They get they get other perks, so it's it's quite BS. So I mean, especially when they get towards the end of the month. Yeah. Then, then, yeah, especially state troopers in my state in particular, uh, because we're a commonwealth, but just our state troopers are just major butts. And it, you're not, if they pull you, you're getting a ticket. Do you I think, mean, though, do you, do you think, though, as a Westerner, it's kind of, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying we should all live like those sorts of scenarios in, in countries overseas, but do you think, as, the Western world, and not to kind of divide us all by left and right and east and west, but do you think we have, over the years, got to health and safety oriented almost, whereas potentially these other countries aren't as um, up to date with like health and safety, or is it just a case that they are far more densely populated and that is just that's how it is and nothing can be done about it? Yeah, it's yeah, it's exactly. I think it's a pretty much both. Uh, we, we've we've been doing it the way we we've been doing it for so long that like it like going back going back to if one of us went over there, oh, it'd be mortifying until we got used to it. Either that, or you'd be dead within the first five minutes. Yeah, or you know you're going to be causing a wreck or whatever. But yeah, when you grow up over there, and you got that many troop people trying to commute, I mean, there's no question about it that if you if you throw in stoplights, roundabouts, and everything, yeah, it would probably make things safer. But I think people would really, I, I don't think they would be able to adapt to that, and they would just ignore the lights. Yeah. You know? And because there's, I mean, it's, I mean, how many, how many cops could, would they have to have to enforce Yeah, it'd be laws? crazy. I mean, there'd be so many people running lights and continuing, continuing to do. I mean, I would imagine, you know, just because all of a sudden you've been doing this your whole life and, and all these generations and generations of how it's been. And then bam, they try to put like our type of laws and rules in place. It just wouldn't fly. I mean, I don't, I don't think it'll work. I don't think they'll ever get to that point where they'll have that. Now, on on a different subject besides traffic, just on the general uh, safety standards in general, I think, you know, like here in the States, we have OSHA, and, it, and we have a lot of safety measures for workers. Okay, where, yeah that you don't have in a, a lot of other countries where you see them just like you've, you've seen plenty of videos on YouTube building scaffolding. They're not, they're not tied off. Yeah. You know, they're, they're oh, it's just absolutely nuts. And like, those will make your hands sweaty. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, for sure. I mean, I've, I've watched some of those and I'm like, yeah, I, my, my feet, my hands get tangly. Well, some of the um, I know I've seen videos of some of them over in uh, the more Eastern Asia, so sort of uh, the Chinas, the Singapores, and, and those sorts of countries. 
and they literally build like their scaffolding is bamboo. And I'm yeah. thinking, oh geez, I mean, this is like that, this, that this would, isn't this isn't a solid structure. Geez, no, I mean, health and safety here would be all over that in a flash. It's like you, you're not getting away with a flexible scaffolding structure, mate. Sorry. Yeah. No, oh man. No, that you wouldn't be able to. It, it, you'd put four pieces of bamboo up, and they would they would be chewing your ass out. Yeah. They would. It would not happen here. I mean, even even if you you don't have a hard hat on, and even if the interior the building is basically finished, and the, and we're and we're like in the stage of just putting in uh, like say like when i did audio visual stuff you know certain things everything was basically finished but we still have to wear a hard hat regardless yeah you know it's not like it's a open uh open construction and and there's all that stuff going on no it's like it's got carpet and this and that already and it's like why but yeah that's just that's just their standards. If you if you if you're on a six foot ladder, you know, you better be using the the one the right kind of ladder because you can't just use any old ladder. You can't use uh, a wood, aluminum, or fiberglass. In different scenarios, so nice. you have to use the right kind, and it has to be rated for the weight that you're supporting, and and if you go above. You know, like five, I forget, five or six feet, you, you got to be tied off. Yeah. But always hard hat, safety glasses, uh, ear protection, uh, yada, yada, yada. You know, just PPE in general. Yeah. But, and if, and if they see you, I mean, they'll, you know, they're not going to kick you out unless you, conti- you know, continually defy them. But, yeah, they'll, they'll tell you, hey, you need to be wearing this or get out you know high vis high vis vests and whatever it may be but yeah it's crazy though because i all all i think back to is from probably about a century or so it's it's that picture of the guys in new york on that skyscraper empire state building yeah it's it's the empire state building. they're just sat on that beam just like however many hundreds of feet in the air just free dangling the legs on that no having lunch my hand, my hands are getting sweaty just thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's a famous picture. Uh, yeah, but that's the way they did it back then. They didn't have, oh, yeah. the, you know, extra rules, and I, and a lot of people died. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Without, but but, but surprisingly, not as many as you would think when you're, uh, you know, freaking 80, 90 stories up in the air, and and they're just walking around like, yeah, no big deal. Walking around pushing buttons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, walking around pushing rivets. <laughs> yeah, the gods were nuts. I, you know, people people just wouldn't even do that today. No. Or unless they were just absolutely out of their mind cuz, you know. But yeah, that's that's one thing that's crazy when I when I see like China is as advanced as they are, you know, I mean, they have they have the technology and the ability, but it's like they don't care about their workers. And, they, and, the, and as the government, they don't care about their people. Unfortunately, I mean that's been obvious to everybody else in the world. Unless you're over there, you live there, and all you see is the propaganda. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, the, yeah, like you said, the bamboo man, that that always just blows my mind, and and how quick they put it up. But yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's that time of year again. October, of course, brings a unofficial kind of holiday in the form of Halloween. Now, I know for a fact that the Americans do Halloween completely different to how us Brits do it. So, no, do you want to kind of talk about how big Halloween is over in the States, just to kind of, for anybody who's not over there, or doesn't necessarily celebrate Halloween. Like, how how is Halloween done in America? And what what is what is kind of like the big hype of Halloween? It it just depends on who you are. For kids, it's you know the fun of dressing up, but it's it's kind of split with kids. Some of them like doing it. Some of them don't. Uh, the ones that don't just want the candy. You know that sort of thing. Smart ones. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And 
the, the, for adults that have uh, Halloween parties and they really, you know, people will really go all out with like makeup and custom costumes. And I mean, kind of, kind of becomes almost like cosplay. Yeah. Uh, and in a sense, yeah, they full, full out, you know, like, like, like they're going to be putting on a production of something at some places, other places that's much simpler. It, it just depends on where you live and the kind of people that you're dealing with. Some people don't celebrate, or I wouldn't say celebrate. Some people don't do anything yep. with Halloween. They just stay to themselves and keep their light turned out, you know? Yeah. And like my, like my neighborhood is older. So there's, there's, it's, it's, there's getting some younger folks and but it's it's still a lot of retired people okay and, and a lot of parts but there's there, it's it's that's a lot more mixed now but there, but there's not that many kids so like my neighborhood you'll never see a trick or treater like they no. always go like out here where like my parents just like when I grew up it's always been tons of kids trick or treating and that was the big thing. We'd scare people. There'd be hay rods, and we have haunted forests where they, yeah, I mean, haunted houses, you name it. There's all kinds of stuff you can go do. So that's kind of covers it in general. Uh, so in comparison, what is it like? <laughs> it's really weird because I can kind of like go on a whole journey with how halloween has evolved in this country so back when i was like a mid teenager so kind of 14 15 16 i remember going out like for the very first time on halloween going trick-or-treating and it was just literally like the best way i can describe it is it's like going round or it was like going round begging on people's doors. There would be like that. There was nowhere decorated. There was a few people that probably had a pumpkin out, which is probably, you know, having a pumpkin out in the UK when I was younger was probably the most you would get. You never used to get people knocking on the door. Nobody ever used to come around trick or treating. And I remember that like first time I went out, there was just me and my friend and we biked around the village we lived in. And, we caught so many people by like off guard. People just ended up kind of like giving us like a bit of money because they had nothing <laughs> and they weren't prepared at all. So fast forward to modern day and, you know, I, I wouldn't say we do it on the scale of America by no, you know, no means we're, we're miles and miles behind you guys, but a lot more people now make a lot more of an effort. So the last few years, because where I live, I live on like a main road. So what I've, what we've found here is if you live on a main road, not many people bother. So you've got to go onto the side streets or into the estates, the new, like the, the housing estates to really find people who are doing it. So we just yeah. kind of like go down, we go walk around the corner and there's a, a new development just around the corner from us. And we go around there, but there is a lot more people now who are kind of like really decorating their houses up. We've been to places and they've got like a little outbuilding. They'll kind of like decorate it up as if it's like a, with skeletons and things and like a dead man's kind of grotto or something like that. But yeah, yeah no, it's, it's really has changed lots in the, like the last couple of decades, the, retail has kind of cottoned on to it as well so obviously it's pushed more in in the shop so it's more in people's faces than it ever used to be because like i say back in my day when i were a kid back in day when i went lad um there was literally nothing nothing at all yeah it sounded like you 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 also started trick-or-treating whenever here you would not be doing it anymore at that age like there, there's a few 15 or 16 year olds, but typically by the time you're that age, depending on your neighborhood, like if you know people, they they're cool with it as long as you like kind of at least make an effort to to dress up as something, you know they're they're kind of cool with it. But 
but yeah, it sounds. I'm wondering if 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 we have American stores that have come over there or something. Maybe Cause that seems to be a, a a thing that I've noticed, especially when it comes to like say for example fast food and stuff. But we have stores over here that sell nothing but Halloween stuff. Okay, and and like we'll have pop up stores that every year they run out of empty space in a strip mall or where or the mall, regular mall or wherever and boom and they're there for you know a couple months or whatever selling nothing nothing but and then they're out yeah yeah and then you got like places like party city and stuff that sell stuff for every holiday year round you know yeah i, I don't know if y'all have that kind of stuff now then you didn't used to and maybe that's why i don't know um i i I wouldn't really, we don't really have anywhere that sells just specific attire and and decorations and things for Halloween. You'll get the supermarkets will have their seasonal sections and then they they swap out throughout the year. So yeah, they, they're all, they've all got all of their Halloween stuff in. I wouldn't say yeah, I wouldn't say there's anywhere that you could go, not, certainly not where I'm from, that's like dedicated, that sort of thing. The closest place I guess you would get to get in that sort of thing is if you'd go to probably like a joke shop or something, because joke shops over here tend to have costumes and different things all year round. So if you was having like a spooky party in, I don't know, April, May sort of time, that's the sort of place you would go to try and find a costume. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it's obviously... I don't really think we've got any American stores as such that would really, uh, nothing comes to mind. I think it's just the overall American influence and us as a nation looking over at you guys and say, hey, these guys are doing this big thing at the end of October every year. Maybe we should get in on that. And, hey, it looks um, like fun. Yeah. yeah. Any excuse to throw a party, you know? I mean, going back to what you said about being... Like on the older side of it for trick or treating, I I totally get what you're saying. I have that exact same view now when I see older, to like mid to old teenagers going around trick or treating. I just think to myself, yeah, you're just trying your look, really, aren't you? Seeing what sweets and goodies you can <laughs> get out of people for free. Yep. But you know, at the end of the day, as long as they're not causing any trouble and you know they're not hurting anybody, then you know. Fair play to them. Like I say, as a nation, you know, it's not something we've been doing for all too long. So I I see people are almost doing it more in a way to kind of say, hey, we didn't do this. So I'm going to kind of catch up on my youth a little bit. Because like you said, there is a lot of adults that go absolutely crazy over here with their decorations in their, house, uh, in their houses. So yeah, we, have, we have people over here that go full out like, something like the people do on christmas yeah you know just like lights computerized all that kind of stuff yeah they go absolutely nuts and i mean i i know i know some people that even prefer i'm talking about americans of course i know some people who prefer halloween as a holiday yeah. as opposed to actual christmas they they yeah. they see it as a bigger a bigger thing in america in some places than they do christmas yeah, yeah, just a lot of fun, and it's not so. I mean, there's not really. It's not. It, I guess it doesn't feel as like so many traditional kind of things. It's like you just you dress up however you want. There's nothing in particular you have to dress up as. There's nothing in particular you make to eat. There's nothing. It's just literally do what you want, have fun, dress up, don't dress up go all out whatever and that, i think that's why a lot of people love it so much because it's it's more freedom in it in a, in a way than like sort of other holidays that have very particular traditions and foods that yeah. are associated with it you know so other other holidays potentially feel a bit more rigid and set into what you need to do yeah. or how you need to dress sort of thing or or how you need to act Whereas exactly. Halloween's kind of like more of a, a free for all, just go out there, have a bit of fun and yep. um and enjoy a bit of community spirit. 
for anybody that is going out there in, in Halloween, if there is any younger listeners, or if you are indeed an older listener who is um, busy decorating their house and getting ready for Halloween, make sure everybody stays safe out there and um, don't cause any trouble. And uh, yeah, just get out there and have some fun, guys. Okay, so something I wanted to talk to you about, Deathwish, and I think we can, I'm pretty sure you can relate to this, and I know I've got experience in this myself. This goes to looking at work, okay? So your career, not necessarily your career, but just work in general. Um, you're, you are or you did freelance work, right? You are a freelancer? You did freelance, right? Uh, as far as, like, what? the category of work uh well no just in general so uh okay let me let me rephrase so what go ahead yeah um you're kind of like uh self-employed right you you kind of work for yourself you're freelancer slash a contractor kind of thing right is that right is that right am i right yeah yeah Uh, absolutely yeah okay so um Obviously, freelancing or contracting isn't something you've always done. So what kind of made you take the jump from working for a company to then almost working for yourself? Was there anything that kind of pushed you in that direction? Or did you just wake up one morning and think, oh, you know what? I'm sick of working for Joe. Joe sucks. I want to work for myself. How did you uh, kind of... Get in, get into it, so to speak. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it wasn't just waking up one morning. Basically, from like I'll say seventeen to twenty four, twenty five, I I worked for I was employed. Yeah, you know I did anything from painting deliveries to, and I, and I got into doing a lot of car stereo and customization, building custom enclosures and door panels and all that kind of stuff, you know, alarm systems, all that stuff. And then uh, I ended up moving back because I had moved about three and a half hours away. And I ended up moving back when I was around 25. And I, I just got something... That was close by just for some money until I found like something else. And and it was a new company that two guys they own they owned their own company. And I was not the one that had a warehouse and they sold nuts and bolts and stuff to like commercial places. And I ended up because there wasn't enough business for the the, the bed liners, and that's what the new one was, was bed liners and uh, truck accessories basically but mainly yeah. mainly, mainly bed liners to dealerships so not n- nothing retail and but i would do a lot of delivering of the nuts and bolts and all that stuff and then and then i got to where i was doing the truck accessories full time and then i got to where uh, I, I got it built up enough to where i was constantly on the road and i was doing i, I was doing about 20,000 a month you know, gross. Yeah, and, and then I got an offer from for, um, from Ford because I did a lot of Ford dealerships and and one one in particular in Richmond, and they they have a Ford has a a company called Automotive Rebuilders, which that which supplies the dealerships with Ford accessories. So they stopped using third parties, and they started, and they, and they cut me out and anybody else, and and they and they were forced to use Ford stuff, and they even though they didn't want to, they wanted to use me. So what they did, the guys there offered me a job to work for them, and like offered all kinds of benefits, free cell phone, blah blah blah. Well, I was going to take them up on it, and then so I told. The owners of, you know, Park Accessories of Virginia is what it was called. And the, the one one owner was like, well, I thought you maybe wanted to 
by the business. I was like, I didn't know you, you wanted to sell. So they basically drew up contract. I bought them. And then it was, that was my first business. Okay. Uh, and, and then from then on, I did that and I, I worked, I've only worked at one other place where I was employed and that was at a truck accessory place where I sold my inventory and everything else and was a manager there for about five years. And then I went back to self-employed and I've been that ever since that was, I, I, I worked there from 2000 to 2005. And then ever since then I've been back to subcontracting and yeah, stuff like that. Uh, like I'll, I'll still do different things. Like I'll, I can build stuff, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll paint, I'll, I'll do, you know, audio, video, car stereo, you know, whatever people are looking for, you know, where, where it comes out, you know, comes around, you know, I can, I, I, I'm kind of, you know, jack of all trades. Master that's quite, one. that's quite interesting then that you say, you know, this situation presented itself to you and you they drew a contract and you bought the business off them so did you be, prior to that had you given any consideration about working for yourself or was it just the fact that here's an opportunity presented to me in front of me i'm going to kind of like grab it with both hands and see what i can make of it yeah uh, actually before, not too long before i moved back i had gotten a business license and uh, I had an LLC and I started getting a product and I was doing drop shipping. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to, yeah. Yeah. And I, I basically had a catalog people would buy stuff and I'd drop, have it drop ship. Yeah. Okay. And so that, that, that was uh, like, I, I kind of always wanted to just, work for myself you know yeah so, okay so that, so that was kind of always back in my head and then you know and then i moved because things didn't work out where i was and, and then when i moved back things just happened you know like i said they just kind of they kind of worked out and it's kind of worked out ever since so yeah it's, it's just obviously the reason i asked the question i found that quite interesting because I had a period of where I was self-employed and, and contracting and you saying that kind of like they presented the opportunity to you and you took it was, it's, it's kind of like how it all came about for me. Really. I was, I went to obviously university and part of my university degree, we had a third year was actually out in industry. So we was out at a company working. So I went to work for this mortgage brokerage company and I was doing all of their IT. And I went back to uni, did my final year. While I was there, I was still working for this company. And I was traveling between Nottingham and Grantham once a week, spend some time in the office. And then I was on the phone for the rest of the week if anybody else had any problems that I could deal with. And then I came out of university and I negotiated a deal with the, the owner and got a contract and decided to work for them full time. And while I was there, I was kind of starting to think, not necessarily that I wanted to work for myself full time, but I was kind of thinking about doing some freelance work for people in like the evenings and the weekends, just to kind of try and earn a little bit of money. And I just happened to be talking to the financial director at the time. And I don't know, it kind of got a bit, lost in translation i was kind of saying oh i'm thinking about you know going freelance doing a bit of freelance work half an hour later i had a call from the md to go and see him in his office and he was like oh so derek tells me that you're thinking about going freelance and i was like yeah i've, I've given it some thought and he was like well okay i tell you what we'll we'll not we'll not employ you anymore we'll take you on as a contractor and i was like oh oh okay um sure so literally i walked out of the office that day i was no longer employed and i was now self-employed i mean it, it works a bit differently but over here 
if you want to be a, I don't know how, again, I don't know how it works in America, but if you want to be a sole trader or a freelancer, you can just literally go on the government website and register yourself as self-employed. And then every year you just fill in a tax return to say what you've earned. This is the tax I need to pay at the end of the year. Boom, job done. But I don't know. I to, to get back onto the, the top of the conversation, why I was asking about freelance is I found it really difficult when I was freelancing because I don't know if it's the situation that I was given at the time, literally like taken straight out of an employment and said, right, you're not employed anymore. You're now a contractor to us. But I felt like I'd lost, I, I don't, not like I'd lost control, but an element of, an element of something was out of my control. And it was more of a case that actually I'm not guaranteed now to get this every month. And I don't know, I, I, I kind of, started to regret my decision. Um, I don't know if that's just a per personal thing for me or if it was just the situation that I was given and the way things were dealt. But yeah, I found like it put, it put a lot of pressure on me in the, in the early stages because I was no longer guaranteed to earn a set amount of money every month. And I did manage to pick up some some other regular work as well. So, you know, I kind of, it wasn't as bad as it was in the end. But I don't know, I don't, I didn't really, for me, I didn't enjoy my time as a freelancer. Yeah, I don't know if, like, how you are structured. Like, over here, especially in IT and certain other things, like a lot of things, if if you go to where you're a subcontractor, or whether it's in IT or, or you know, construction or whatever whatever it may be and typically if you go from being employed to to that you make a lot more money than when you were employed yeah but the the downside is you know there's you you have a lot more paperwork to do for your for, for just your accounting in general yeah and then and and as well as your tax forms because you got to fill out completely different tax forms and I, and all that all that sort of stuff. So I would say that's the only downside, but it's not that big a deal. Uh, you know, when I, when I had the, the first business, and you know, had a record month the first month that I took over, and you know, by 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 the year's end, I was, you know, I was doing about one point four million the first year, uh, gross, and. So I had a I had a lawyer that took care of I was an S corp, so I was a corporation, I was incorporated, and I had a, a tax guy, and all I did was just you know I had my software that plugged everything in. Yeah. Yep. And then I you know of course I I paid my own uh, quarterly t uh, federal and state t taxes, and s some of them were monthly. But most were quarterly. You can do quarterly, and uh, that sort of thing. And then at the end of the year, I just printed out uh, what I needed to print out for the CPA, and he took care of uh, doing the income taxes. Yeah, which you know was worth a hundred and twenty bucks or whatever it was back then. Yeah. So yeah. Other than that, though, yeah, I made a lot more money. Because I went from making, uh, I think at, I had gone up to nine dollars an hour back then. Yeah, I mean, you know, that was in the late nineties. So, but yeah, it, it, you know, I I liked it. Yeah, I I kind of feel feel for me that I don't know. Maybe it was because I was fresh out of university and it was like my first job qualified and i was just sort of starting to settle down a little bit with katie and you know try and we've got the the wedding coming up and different bits and pieces i don't know i know you should never feel like you're pressured into anything but i kind of did and it really felt like it left me in a vulnerable pos vulnerable position yeah. whereby 
you know, nothing was certain anymore. So Yeah, I totally get that. I, I did that for I don't think I did it for more than 18 months. And then the the mortgage company I had IT support people who were like my IT support that if I couldn't sort anything, I could go to them. They were more sort of like the second and third line. And I had a good relationship with the, the owner of that company. So one day I had a conversation with him and yeah, the rest is kind of history. You know, he, he took me on and 13 and a bit years later, I'm, I'm still here, <laughs> which is quite mad really. Um, to think that I've been, Working from home on my own for like 13, over 13 years is really crazy, to be fair. Um, I mean, I suppose, cool. I suppose from your point of view as well, like thinking back to that, that sort of early day, I mean, probably you can relate to it more now, but um, how do you find working from home yourself? How, how do you keep on keep yourself focused if you've got work to do to you know not get kind of distracted do you have like a, a routine or a schedule that you adhere to or do you if you've got stuff to do do you literally just do it as and when you feel like it yeah uh i'm kind of i'm one of those people that like like for example if you go on a vacation yeah plan on where we're going you know other than that play it by ear okay and that's that's kind of how i do that you know it, i i don't like to have to like in the back of my mind knowing i have to be here at this time until this time and i hate these things you know and, but it's part of life yeah so you know you can't avoid them i mean so like when i go to do something at if i if i'm going to do something at somebody's house then, you know, I don't have to be there exactly at a particular time, but, you know, generally I'm there from sometime in the morning till afternoon or what have you, or, yeah, you know, it, but it varies, you know, depending on what, what I'm doing. So I suppose, again, uh, that's the difference between our situations now, I guess, where you're contracting, I'm employed. So I have like hours of employment that I have to, dear to whereas for contracting it's kind of like well as long as i get the job done in my day it doesn't matter what time of day i kind of do it it just needs to be done at some point yeah and, I, and see the thing is I, I did that with when i when i bought them when i bought them out with the truck accessory business uh you know i had i would set up things and i would have days where i'm going okay hey guys don't don't call me for anything. I'd let them know in advance. Like yeah, my main my main dealerships. I let them know in advance. Hey, on on this coming up Thursday or whatever. I'm like I'm I'm or Wednesday or Thursday. It might even be two days, but typically it would have been like one day. I'm like I will not be doing any deliveries. So, but you know, call me. We'll put it in, and I'll get everything done the next day. Yeah, and and that you know, so I went about it that way, and then on those days that I I wasn't, I was kind of taking off, but I, I was mainly just kind of catching up with invoicing, paperwork, and and billing, going through who hadn't who hadn't paid me yet, and I would be making calls like, "Yo, y'all are ordering, get an order, and I'm supposed to be coming there to." Do some stuff for you, but you haven't paid your your last bill. Yeah, uh, you're gonna you're gonna write me a check when I come with this one. Did uh, you? Um, and, and, yeah, but you know, in in like taking over the business and inheriting somebody else's business, did you not have people to do all that sort of thing for you? Do oh no, no I did it. I I did everything myself. Okay. Yeah, hundred percent everything. Like the only thing I didn't do was file my income taxes. Okay, and that okay. that I, that that was just a once a year thing that I paid, yeah, you know, menial amount. And then, like I said, I did have a lawyer, but the only thing they did that's a, that was a once a year thing, where they just did the the paperwork for 
the corporate the corp- incorporated part. Yep. Uh, and that because that's the way it was already set up, and I was like, that's fine. I don't want to really deal with that stuff anyway, and it's only once a year, so no big yeah. deal. And that worked, and that worked fine. So, but yeah, otherwise everything else, like uh, bookkeeping, to you know, you know, phone setting everything up, scheduling all that stuff. Yeah, it was I, all I down to you. Out. Yeah, yeah. Which was which was nice. I didn't have to worry about somebody else screwing things up. So. Even if I could, even if I, but even if I hired somebody, I, I just wouldn't have been able to trust him to do the kind of job I did. Well, no, and I, I get that. And being as a business owner, you want to make sure that everything is working smoothly and there's there's no issues. But I know from experience, in like in my business here, my boss used to be exactly the same, and he used to do everything. But you know, fair play to you for doing it because I've seen how my boss handled it. And, you know, he, he realized after a few years that it just wasn't getting anything done. So he had to get people in and distribute the, the work to other people because, you know, he was, he was out taking client meetings and generating new business. But at the same time, he'd then come back and he'd spend hours on the accounts or hours on invoicing or hours on this and hours on that. And yeah, there was just wasn't enough time in the day. So but you to say that, you know, you took charge of all of that and managed it all yourself, you know, my hat off to you, dude, because, yeah, like I say, I've, I've seen how it how it is for a business owner that has too much on their plate and uh, having to juggle too many hats at once, definitely. Yeah, I just kind of balanced it, and I, I, I was, I'd say I was actually quite efficient with the way I did things. So, like, when, for example, like you were talking about, he was trying to drum up new business and... You know, a lot of people will take that as a full time job. Yeah. Uh, yep. You know, well, well <clears throat> the way I worked that was uh, like when I, I had routes, I would go that I had kind of set up like I had my daily stuff and I would still hit those. But then at a certain time of the month, I would call up certain dealerships that were further out that okay. didn't order as much. And I would be like, hey, I'll be coming out to your area. Let me know what you need in the next, you know, within the next three, four, five days, or whatever. And then, like, say, when I was going on wherever I was going, uh, if uh, if I see a, a new dealership or one that had an order in like a few weeks or a month, I would stop by, say hi, maybe because a lot of times uh, the person who was ordering before left and somebody new came in and they had no clue uh, that I was the one that they went to. Yeah. So I would have to re- kind of start things back over and be like, yeah, hey, okay, nice to meet you, blah, blah, blah. Give them, give them my card and all that. And yeah, I've been serving y'all for this long. And and I would kind of do that as I was doing my my installs and deliveries and things. Yeah. So that that worked out and it kind of kept and the, the and even the ones that I already had accounts with uh, I would stop by there as well if I was you know because usually it was along along the way anyway so yeah. and that just to keep that relationship going and them seeing well, my yeah, face I mean, if you if you're passing the door and you're in the area then you know just like you say popping your head around the door and saying hi I'm still here don't forget about me if you need anything sort of thing just keeps that um relationship going between uh yourself and the client doesn't it yeah and i and i usually knew the salesmen that were like you know that that, that didn't go through the revolving door the ones that were there for yeah many years and like salesmen would call me directly and say boom i need this da, 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 da. so they didn't have to go through like the, the uh, an ordering person where some places do but a lot of them, yeah. So I, I made sure that I, I knew like the main sales people and, and 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 the truck sales people and all that kind of stuff, so that they knew who I was, they knew what I did, and so they could, and any one of them could call me. So it wasn't yeah. just to one person, you know, which was yeah. you know it worked it worked out quite well until 
things changed and but that worked out too you know i was able to liquidate my inventory pay off uh, what i had and to to you know what i had for the business and and you know i was making good money there yeah so but yeah 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 it was all good everything worked out all right, guys, that brings us to the end of this shorter version of the Notcast. Hope you have enjoyed our discussion throughout. Before we wrap this one up, though, I want to pose a suggestion to anybody listening along. If you have got any questions that you would like us to answer in the next episode, please do leave them in the comments below. Now, this could be anything specifically to me specifically to death wish or it could be a question to both of us to get both of our opinions if you've got anything that you would like us to answer and discuss in the next episode please do leave them in the comments below and we will go through them in the next episode as always death wish thank you very much for joining me on this one uh, of course uh always always glad to be a part of anything you're involved with thank <laughs> you for having me not a problem anything good coming up in the next week next month been exciting to tell us before we head out uh no not really uh just uh the, the same old same old so not sleeping playing wordscapes <laughs> just generally rambling on yep that sounds about right uh jamming jamming to some music uh checking your discord out and that sort of thing backseat and live streams yeah Speaking of live streams, I do just want to make an announcement. I didn't know where to do it, but since we're on the topic, I will make the announcement here at the end of the podcast. Oh! As, so, as a lot of people are aware, there is a game that a lot of people are excited about coming out what, what, in oh, a, sorry. about what, a week's time. Uh, what, what game is that? <laughs> the the Talos Principle 2 is oh, on the horizon. I have not heard of that. Let me, let me Google it. Uh, I, I hear uh, there's there's somebody on Discord, uh, particularly Porphyrius, I think, is, has heard of that game. No, I, I don't think I've ever heard him mention it. Never. Uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're right. I'm not sure. Hmm. I, don't know where, I don't know where you're getting that from at all, Deathwish. I think you're just making stuff up now for content. Yep, dare yep, you? that's me, man. Okay. You know anyway, me. I digress, or we digress. <laughs> So, yeah, big game around the corner. I know a lot of you are going to be playing it. It's Talos Principle 2. And a lot of people have been asking whether or not I will be playing it. The answer to that question is yes, I will be playing it. Now, here is my plan for playing it. I am still in the middle of a Kingdom Hearts Rechain of Memories playthrough on my stream. So my intention is I'm going to finish that off, which I believe there is somewhere between... 10 to 15 hours left of gameplay left on that game that will give everybody enough time who buys the game to play it enjoy it all and see it for themselves spoiler free then after i've finished kingdom hearts reach and remember we're going to take a break from kingdom hearts and i will be diving in to the talos principle too so like i say i just want to give everybody a bit of time to play it for themselves and get well established with the game before I start playing it in case anybody wants to watch along with me. So that's my plan with Talos 2. And um, hopefully everybody who wants to see me play it will then be able to enjoy my playthrough as much as their own. But yeah, other than that, anything else to add, Deathwish? Or are you done? Are we yeah, done? Well, we done? of course. Of course, as always. Uh, the, yeah, the, the Talos Principle 2. I mean, you're going to wait, but you're going to record it. Yep. So, so that means you're going to force me to play it. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I want to watch you play it, but you're going to force me to play it, <laughs> uh, you know, at least far enough ahead and try to stay ahead of you, which, uh, yeah. I don't know. That's difficult for me to do. Uh, I'm pretty leisure when it comes to playing through. I'm not. I'm not like Porphyrus. I'm not. It, it, to him, it's like for me. Like if it was Portal Three or something, or Half Life Three, or anything Valve Three, 
the yeah, I would, I, I, I understand where he comes from, but yeah, I, I, I'll probably have to uh, either stay ahead or just not watch your streams or videos. <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm giving you two to three weeks grace there of where you can play a little bit, get ahead, and stay ahead. So uh, that's tough. I got you. Okay, so w November the second is when it comes out. Correct. So you're not going to start posting any playthrough videos until it'll be more towards to like towards mid, December, mid to end of November. So you've got a good, I, I would say you've got at least the first two or three weeks in November to play it and, you know, get it, get to a certain point and get ahead before I even start tackling it. Uh, you're not going to start until then? No. Okay. Uh, I might be able to get in an hour. Or, I'm just, or, or, or. I'm just basing that on what I've done so far in is has taken me 29 hours and I've heard people say that the second half is about third of the length of the first part. So if I've spent 30 hours, it's going to take me another 10 hours at least to get through the rest of the game. So yeah, I think that's going to be three to four weeks worth of streams. So we're going to be looking at the back end of November. So no excuses, death, death wish. Um, gotcha. Gotcha. Get, Get get your thumb out your ass yeah. and make some progress. <laughs> That's an order. I, I, I will, yes, sir. I will focus on that. It, I, I do have plans. I literally have it. Uh, it. It's clicked on in my Steam, and I'm looking at the you, you know the picture. Yeah, and the. the Let's see, next fest maybe ever, but the demo lives on. Yeah, the activity in the feed. Yep. Uh, I mean, I have it there. I'm ready to download it as soon as it comes in, as soon as they release it. And then I will definitely be playing it, but I uh, can't say that. I, I would guess that uh, Porphyrus would will be way ahead of me in the first few days. <laughs> well, I guess that will be, uh, that remains to be seen, as they say. I think that's a good place to leave it. As like I said before, thank you very much for joining me as always, buddy. I appreciate it. And until the next one, I've been Ock. He's been Deathwish. And you've been awesome. Indeed. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye! -bye. Bye.